Hi, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science related with the best minds in the field. I'm Vishnu, and today's episode will be Miega Kure, a 4D platformer game. With me today, I have Mark Ten Bosch, a game developer and the creator of Miega Kure. Welcome, Mr. Bosch. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. First off, can you give us a brief overview of what Miega Kure is and how you play it? Yeah, so Miega Kure is a four dimensional puzzle game. And that means that uh, instead of the regular three dimensions that we're familiar with, there are four dimensions of space uh, in this game. And the way that they're represented is that you only see three dimensions at a time, but you can switch which three dimensions you're seeing by pressing a button. Um, And what that means is that um, it's sort of like taking a three-dimensional slice through a four-dimensional world. Uh, A two-dimensional slice through a three-dimensional world would be, um, for example, you just like what what an MRI looks like. So, you know, you have like a 3D object and you can take a slice up and down and see different cross sections of it. Here you're you're having the same effect, but in one higher dimension. Um, So you're seeing a three dimensional slice of a four dimensional object. Um, And the mechanic of the game is that you can rotate the slice that you're seeing and then navigate it and then rotate it back. Um, So the, the, actually the way that it ends up being when you play it is that you see um, either like a 3D world as usual, and then you press a button and everything deforms and morphs, and you can move along in the fourth dimension that way, and then you press it again and it morphs back. Um, in the end, it feels a lot like moving between parallel universes. Um, so taking different um, slices through the four dimensional space, each slice that you take looks like a different universe and people are often uh, they, people have a lot of experience thinking of you know moving between parallel and universes uh, in you know in different media and things like that so um, there's there's a lot of parallels there but the actual way that you play it is uh, is hard to properly describe so it's sort of more you have to play the game to actually um, get a good understanding of how exactly you move between the different parallel universes and 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 that that kind of stuff in this game it's possible to walk through walls can you explain how this works so i was saying that it when you taking multiple cross sections through the fourth dimension each cross section sort of feels like a different parallel universe so there might be one parallel universe that has a wall but if you take a different cross section, there is no wall there. Um, so if you can move in 4D uh, to that cross section or that world where there is no wall, then you can move. Uh, there's nothing blocking you anymore. So you can just walk right past the wall and then um, go back to the first cross sections that, that you were that you started in, and you'll be on the other side of the wall. So it feels like you walked through the wall. Um, but actually what you did is that you walked around it in the fourth dimension. Um, yeah. So how did you manage to build this 4D world? What was the mathematics behind it and how did the software work? Yeah. Um, so when you program a video game, every position, uh, in the game, like every object has a position. And that position is represented using three numbers, um, which is how far along along three directions uh, um, right? And it's just three numbers, right? And computers, all they do is manipulate numbers. So you can just add another number to that list. And then you have four numbers and um, the game sort of works the same way, right? Like you can move along each direction and that will change the number in each uh, your your coordinate along each direction. Uh, so the actual the actual like moving around and storing positions 
uh, at the very basic level is very similar to how you would program a normal 3D video game. So it's more about how do you show a 3D scene, which then gets projected to a 2D screen, right? Um, that that part is the sort of the harder part, and that, that's what I was saying. It's like you taking a slice through it, for example. But there's other ways that you can do it. Um, in terms of actually building 4D worlds, um, the way that I'm doing it is just taking how people make 3D games and just generalizing that to one dimension higher. Because we're already doing like 2D games and 3D games. So there's already um, sort of two examples of different dimensions. Um, so you can just keep that pattern going and see like, oh, okay, like what would it be like in 4D? So for example, um, in 3D games, you have the surface of objects and every object you just show um, the surface of it. Like you can't see inside an object, obviously. So you only need to show the surface, right? And the surface is represented by a list of triangles. So you just make, you build up the surface by just, you know, connecting triangles next to each other and making this, this shape, right? Um, well, what's the sort of, you take the triangle, it's like, what's the dimension? What's the object that is most like a triangle, but has one more dimension, right? So a triangle is a 2D thing, and you're connecting all these 2D things together to make up a 3D object, right? So what's the equivalent of the triangle in 3D is a tetrahedron. So like the simplest shape that you can make out of, um, uh, the simplest 3D shape that you can make out of a, 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 the minimum number of points, right? So like in, in 2D, if you have three points, that makes a triangle. But if you only have two points, that just makes a line, which is one dimensional. So that's not really two dimensional. So you need one more point to make a triangle. And in 3D, you add another point and it makes a tetrahedra. Um, so you just, you know, you just take what people have already been doing, which is, make the surface of an object using triangles and you just say, okay, well, the surface of a 40 object uh, is gonna be made out of tetrahedra instead of triangles. Um, and their coordinates are gonna have four dimensions instead of three dimensions. And then, then the question becomes, well, how, how do you define which tetrahedra you use? And mostly, what I do is just use a procedural method or just um, basically using math, you know, simple mathematical shapes to, to define the different objects. Um, so for example, a sphere is all the points that are a certain distance from the center. Uh, in 4D, well, that's the same. It's like, all the points are a certain distance in, from the center, but uh, in four dimensions instead of three dimensions. And then if you know that, then you can find out which tetrahedra you would wanna use to build up a sphere. Um, so there's a lot of procedural, um, just using the computer to define those shapes instead of actually like placing every single point by hand, which would be something that you would do more in a 3D game. Um, but you still can still combine things together and just in general, like I was saying, like uh, think about what it would be like in 3D and just kind of generalize that to one more dimension. I'm sure that having to translate these 3D objects into 4D presented many challenges. What would you say was your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? Yeah, well, there were a lot of uh, challenges across many different um, disciplines, almost like game design wise, how do you make something that's understandable for people? Um, something that's actually 4D, but still understandable? Or how do you teach the mechanics of the game over many levels? Um, 
but I think the biggest challenge was either doing 4D physics, um, so taking the laws of how objects bounce, roll around, um, um, slide across each other, things like that, um, and generalizing to them to 4D. Um, that was really fun, actually. And I um, have a publication at SIGGRAPH this year about the math of how that works. Um, it's sort of a higher fidelity. Like, you can make a game with very simple physics, but this is trying to be very high fidelity, very much like objects can be, um, you know, in many different configurations and rotate um, realistically, whatever that means in 4D. Um, um, but another thing that was incredibly difficult was I wanted to have four-dimensional creatures in the game, and there's no way to do that without just generating it procedurally. And so... I had to just start from scratch. And even in 3D, that's difficult. Like, how do you procedurally create, um, you know, like a four-legged creature and have it animate and move around? Um, but to do it in 4D was, like, even more difficult. But that was really fun. Um, so, so, yeah. So, even one of those two things, I think. Well, another question I had was, your concept for Miyagakure is super unique. What inspired you? Yeah, so I, I was one. I, I was looking for an interesting game idea, but also, I as a programmer, when you like I was saying, like when you program a, a game, there's always those three numbers that you have um, to represent the position. Or if you're making a two D game, just two numbers. And eventually you realize that, oh, like you could just have four numbers and the math wouldn't be that different. It'd be very similar. So um, it was kind of a joke, like, oh, I could make a 4D game. I don't know what it would be like, or I can make, you know, even higher dimensions. Like a lot of the algorithms that you use to, for example, compute collisions between the different objects uh, just are exactly the same, no matter what the dimension is. Some of them get really complicated, but some of them are just exactly the same. So at the base level, it was like, oh yeah, I could totally do the basic, um, the basic programming for for uh, a high dimensional game. Um, and I was just, I had a um, a list of game ideas, and one of them was that, and I didn't really know what that would entail, um, but um, eventually, like, I wanted to make a prototype of some interesting game to show it at the experimental, experimental Gameplay Workshop at GDC, which shows, like, experimental uh, game ideas. And so I just looked at my list, and I was like, oh, okay, like, I can make a 4D game. I could see what that would look like. And I didn't really know what that would mean, but I... Um, just tried it anyway and tried doing things. And it was like kind of successful, but not really. And then eventually I started reading about 4D space because um, people have been thinking about it for a while, like ever since the math was discovered, like maybe like a little bit more than a hundred years ago. Um, and so, you know, lots of people have written books about what you could do if you could move in four dimensions. And it was obvious, like once I saw that, like, like oh, that's perfect for a game because there are a lot of things that you could do if, if you could move in four dimensions that you can't do if you can move in three dimensions. And um, because of that, you could make every puzzle in the game about a specific um, situation that you can do in 3D, but you can do in 4D. Like for example, like go inside uh, a, a building that's closed completely in all three dimensions, but it's not closed in four dimensions, or bind two rings without breaking them. 
Um, and so, yeah, that, it's like a perfect setup for a game where each puzzle is about one of those situations. So, How did people perceive your idea? Yeah, I think people are usually pretty excited about it because they feel like, first of all, like it's a very original thing and they want to just see it for themselves. Um, and I think some people also said that because it's such a common mathematical thing, like to think of dimensions, that, um, you know, if people grow up playing games like that, that it will make better scientists or better physicists. Like someone might grow up and play that game and become like a much more successful physicist that they would have been uh, if they hadn't played it, you know, or they might inspire them to, to become physicists or things like that. So um, I think that's really cool. And that's the end of this one. Huge thanks to Mr. Ten Bosch for agreeing to be on the podcast. If you enjoyed this, be sure to subscribe with bell notifications on so you never miss another episode. And don't forget to hit like. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.